begin our class, let's open with a with a prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we come into your presence. We're great, grateful to be able to keep in contact during this time of uh, social distancing, to be able to uh, gather around your word and to learn about the uh, letter uh, to the Hebrews. We ask that you would continue to strengthen us and give us faith uh, in this trying time. Help us to know you are in charge and give us that peace uh, which uh, passes all understanding. We ask you bless the brothers and sisters uh, that are, are struggling in this time. Uh, give them courage and faith. And those that have lost loved ones like Sister Shirley Smith, um, we ask that you have special blessing on uh, people like that that are, that are either sick or have loved ones that are sick or that have passed away. And uh, we ask your blessing on us this morning as we continue. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, so uh, we're in our fourth and what should be our final class on Hebrews chapter four. I don't know who's taking the next class. It won't be me, um, but I'm, I'm sure they'll figure that out. Um, whoever they is that's in charge of that sort of thing. Um, and so as I've, as I've done in the past, I, uh, oh, it looks like uh, uh, Rob Scott is going to take chapter five. He's the they. Um, or maybe he's the determiner of the they. I don't know. Um, anyway, we're going to go on to uh, Hebrews chapter four, the um, last bit. And as I've done in, in every um, class, I'm going to start off with uh, sort of an, uh, an overview, um, more global concept. And this one actually is pertinent to our lesson today, but it also is probably um, of steps a little a little bit outside of Hebrews, and that is we're going to take a look at the concept of what a test versus a temptation is. So, in uh, J, there, there, there's a difference between a, a trial or a test and a temptation, and we're going to talk about those things. And there's a lot of confusion about it, um, and uh, I'll explain kind of what the confusion is and why it why it presents a problem to us as we're trying to um, exposit the scriptures. So, for example, here's two verses, and they seem to give uh, conflicting ideas, and you can see the translator spin on these things. Um, James 1, verse 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Okay, and then in Matthew 6, 6 13, of course, a, a line from uh, what we know as the Lord's Prayer, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So the translators have taken the same Greek word, uh, perirasmos, um, which means a putting to the proof, and translated it two different ways. There's not a Greek word that distinguishes between a trial and a temptation. So the translators, I think, um, rightly have have uh, translated them different ways but the the, the underlying greek um, doesn't necessarily imply the difference but the two concepts in in a nutshell are that are, are both uh, both related by this word uh, parasimos is uh, a temptation and, and what a temptation is uh, as we're kind of biblically speaking today it's it's a moral choice brought on by lust. So it's it's when we um, have a choice between doing something right and wrong, it's that internal dialogue we have uh, about what choice to make, whether to obey God or to um, obey our own desires. A trial, on the other hand, uh, can take uh, many different kind of forms, but uh, um, it is that thing which is essentially excites those lusts. And, you know, sometimes it can be very um, direct as it directly plays on some sort of lust we have, or it can be very indirect. You know, you, we, we, you know, you, uh, we read in, in Job about his trials. And, you know, it's not until later on in the book that we really kind of understand that, you um, Job had a, had a little pride that he was dealing with, and he, he became a little overzealous in his proclamation of his of his rightness and justice. In the face, of course, you know he had the trials. Uh, Job's trials were uh, one, you know, the, the the 
things that he faced, the loss of his children, the loss of his property, the loss of his health. That was a trial. Then, of course, his wife was uh, not very helpful to him. Um, so that was another trial that he faced. But then his friends came and they presented another trial that, you know, basically accusing him of secret sins. Um, and uh, Job became a little, uh, uh, let's say, uh, overstated his case of his righteousness and um, showed, showed an underlying problem that he needed to address. So that's the difference kind of between tempta temptation and trials. And in this study, I think it's very important that we, uh, you know, what we understand and distinguish between um, temptations and trials. Temptations, 100% of the time, have to occur inside of our head. And so, you know, we will say things in the English language like, you know, um, those brownies tempted me, you know, or, or so-and-so really tempted me to do this and that. It's really kind of a misuse of the biblical uh, way that those words are used. Uh, temptations have to be within the, the uh, between our two ears, as you will. They have to be within our brain. Um, and again, because we can't, we can't make an external moral choice. But again, it's the ambiguity of our language, isn't it? But trials can, can occur both in our head and outside of our head. So we might be um, uh, you know, walking down the street and, and, and something just happens which excites our lust and gets us thinking about uh, uh, having to make a moral choice. But these things can also happen in our head. You know, we can be just sit, be sitting there and um, thinking about things in terms of life and kind of walk our way right into a, a temptation because of, of the thought process we've had within our heads. So trials can, we can also try ourselves, um, but they can also be external. And uh, as we're going to see, you know, God uh, does try us. It does test us, but God does not tempt us. That ha absolutely has to happen within our brain. And we're going to see why this is important later as we uh, continue in this, this thing. So let's uh, look at James 3.1. I mean, uh, James uh, 1.13. It says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And I think those are rightly translated there. God does not put a moral choice in our heads. He doesn't put a thought in our heads. He doesn't make us think certain things or whatever to make a moral choice. Or he certainly doesn't make us choose right or wrong in our heads. That's uh, up to us and our free will. Um, and then we're going to, we'll look a little bit more at James 1 um, in a minute. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire or their lusts and are enticed. Then after... Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Um, but we do know, you know, scripturally speaking, that um, God does test people, right? Um, plenty of verses. We'll just look at two. Deuteronomy 8, 2. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Jeremiah 20, 12, yet, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous, who see the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have set forth my cause. So, um, again, just dis distinguishing there between temptations and test. And God tests us, but he doesn't tempt us. So let's look uh, back at that James uh, one thirteen. And let's kind of understand the process by which sin um, uh, gives birth, if you will, using the metaphor that James uses. Um, so uh, it's still a start of verse 14, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. So lust is another confusing word in the Bible. Lust just means desire. And, and most of the time, in the Bible, lust is considered a bad thing, but not always. We can desire or lust after good things, um, but most of the time when it's used in the scriptures, talking about a lust in the negative sense, about lusting after uh, our own evil desires and things we want. So 
each one of us, I like to call it a lust fingerprint. Um, and the reason I, I, I refer to it is that, you know, fingerprints are unique to each individual and everybody kind of has their own different desires. Now, there's a lot of common desires that people have, right? Lust for money, uh, you know, or things like that. Those are very common to all mankind, but everybody's a little bit different, aren't they? And, and, and you know, here's the point. There's some things that you may desire that I don't desire, and some things I may desire that you may not desire. And so each one of us, you know, there's sometimes that, that you know, a, a certain trial for me may have, may connect with nothing in me, may connect with you, but another trial may connect with me and not connect with you. And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very um, important point to understand that each one of us has our own desires. And so, um, so when, when that lust that we have, that desire we have gets excited, and when I mean excited, I mean there's something that triggers that thought, that, that, that uh, desire is in there just sitting dormant, you know. I may have a lust for money, but I'm not lusting about it all the time, you know. Uh, sometimes I'm thinking about other stuff. But, you know, let's say an opportunity arises and it makes me think about money and all of a sudden I get excited and I start thinking about doing bad things to get more money. Um, that's, that's this process. So these lusts are sitting there dormant, latent, and all of a sudden something excites them, whether it's in our own mind or whether it's something external. Um, and, and all of a sudden now this temptation comes into our mind. Huh, here's, here's an opportunity to do something bad or to... to quell that desire and do something good. And uh, once that happens, um, we have this temptation. We have a moral choice we have to make. And then we can choose right or wrong. But I would suggest it even goes a little bit deeper. And we're not going to look at this because that could take, that'd be another whole Sunday school class. But Jesus seems to suggest that the sin actually occurs when we decide to do the sin. We might not even actually end up going through with it because of opportunity that doesn't present itself for us to do it. We may go in to rob the bank and find out they're having a, uh, an exercise in um, um, security there and the place is filled with uh, you know, uh, 20, 20 uh, security guards. And so, but we went in there with the intent, you know, the desire, we didn't actually rob the bank but uh, our desire and our intent was to rob the bank. So there's the difference, right? And Jesus seems to in, in, indicate that when we, the trigger, you know, the, the, the switch flips in our mind and we go, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sin. I'm going to do this bad thing. That that's when the sin occurs. Um, and, then, and then he says, and this is not an inconsequential thing here at the bank. At the bottom, you know, when sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. And we know that, that, that the wages of sin is death. So uh, let's go on. I, I like this, this analogy. Some of you guys are going to laugh, like the Bostons will probably laugh because they've heard me do this a hundred times. But um, I always go back to the same analogy, and it always involves a 7-Eleven. Why? Because that's what I, how I originally conceived the, the uh, analogy. But this helps really to distinguish between a, a, a trial and temptation and how different lusts come into play. So let's say we got two people, Joe and Ted, and, and let's say for the sake of this argument that God is behind this whole test. And uh, so, so Joe walks in, and God makes the telephone ring, and uh, the, the clerk has to uh, go in the back for a second, is distracted, and they have absentmindedly left that money till open. So Joe, being, you know, uh, ha has a lust for money, so always wants money. So... Um, he, Joe says, he starts looking around, are there any security cameras? Can I grab this money and get out of here? Can I, you know, can I do this thing? So he's, he's in a real rage of a temptation right now. Of, can I steal this money and get away with it? And again, so erase that. Now it's the same thing happens with Ted. And, and Ted walks into the 7-Eleven and God has the exact same thing happens. The phone rings, the clerk walks in the back and, and, this may be you or maybe people you know, the thought never even enters their mind to take that money. He's Joe, uh, I mean, uh, Ted is not tempted at all. Ted, Ted is, you know, he, he's like, well, that's really, you know, um, 
not a very smart thing to do to leave that money till open, you know, might even reach over there and shut the, shut the drawer on the money tills just to, um, so nobody else steals the money. So that's kind of this, uh, distinguishes how, um, these things work and how our lust play into it. And that's really the, the heart of the matter is what lust do we have? And do we, are we fighting those lusts and do we, you know, try to, to work around those? So I would suggest to you too, it's often been said, you probably have heard it said before that God tests us to see what we're going to do. And I would suggest that's not correct. I would suggest that God tests us so that we can see what we're going to do. God knows what we're going to do, right? God, God is, um, uh, knows the end from the beginning. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. Um, so this is not a, a blind test for him. The, the real question that we need to ask is, why was I tempted, right? Why did, why did I react to that um, the way I, that I did? Why did I um, suddenly become uh, very uh, excited about this prospect of sin? And, and that will be lead us very much into um, understanding ourselves and our own lust fingerprint. So uh, as we continue on, as I suggested, um, I don't think God tests us to see what we will do. He knows. Um, God tests us so we can see what, uh, so that we can see and address those issues. Um, Job saw that he had an issue and, and addressed that um, at the end of the book, and he realized, um, if you read the, the book of Job, that he, he realized that his mistake and repented. So there's a, why does God, why does God test us? And this is a thing that's very important to the, to the writer, to the Hebrews, because um, there's all different kind of trials, right? There's little things. There's little things like, um, you know, saying an unkind word about somebody or, or, or telling, a, you know, telling a little lie, you know, um, and then there's, there's big tests, you know, like when we find out we have a terminal diagnosis or when we're um, faced with a, a nationwide shutdown of everything because of a, a pandemic, um, you know, there, there are trials and, and, and this is when our faith, you know, I've kind of been talking about this theme throughout uh, Hebrews 4, but you know, faith is, is uh, really important when we get into these kind of situations, you know, because we need to know where God fits in our life. Do we see him as this loving creator that has all things in his control and, and is working together for our good? And do we really believe those things? Or um, is it sort of like, well, you know, this is, this is, I've always gone to church and this is where I go to church. And, and uh, I, uh, you know, I've been told these things, but maybe they're not that personal to me, but this is kind of little, the little believies that I have that uh, they don't really make, make that much of a difference in my life, but this is kind of what I, I think, you know, and there's a big difference. So faith is really uh, important when we, when we talk about this issue of trials and temptations. So Hebrews 12, let's read Hebrews 12, 7 to 11. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children, for what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. Stop and think about that verse. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. God doesn't, you know, when we go through trials and temptations, one of the, the main questions that comes up, and you, you know, you, you hear this from people now during this COVID-19 outbreak, why? Why is God letting this happen? Why is God doing this? What is all this about? Well. This is one of those great answers in scriptures, but God disciplines us for our own good in order that we may share his holiness. And so um, it's an exercise in, in, in becoming holy and holy means set apart, becoming different, becoming um, more God-like, more Christ-like. That's what holiness means. Um, 
in verse 11, no discipline seems to be pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So if you're looking for an immediate benefit to trials, you know, oh, here I had this trial and I overcame it. And you're looking for some immediate benefit, you might not see it. It might be months, weeks, years before you see the benefit of that trial. And I would also tell you, it tells us elsewhere in scripture, we're not looking at it, but sometimes we're tried for the benefits of others so that others might see the way that we handle things and they will be benefited by it. So um, these trials are necessary and beneficial. And, um, and but as is admitted in this uh, passage, they can also be painful. And so we don't want to be dismissive of these things. When other people are suffering trials, we want to be sympathetic um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's, uh, sometimes when people are experiencing trials, we, um, we're pretty quick to um, uh, throw out some very casual things. I've been guilty of it myself, where you, you know, where you, where you say things that are not that helpful. Well, this must be for a reason. Well, that, yeah, that may be true, but it may not necessarily be helpful. Um, a lot of times, I think, I think Job's three friends really had it right when they first got there, and then they, uh, then they started talking, you know, they were just went and sat with Job. And that was, uh, that was a good comfort. I think that's a good response sometimes. Sometimes we um, are not very helpful in trying to project why people are, are going through trials or have had things happen. Um, sometimes you just don't know. Sometimes it's not for their benefit at all. Sometimes it's for the benefit of other people. So uh, let's move on. Let's talk about the, the priesthood for a second, because this is going to be, um, I, I, I struggled in, in preparing this class because uh, we start in, in, in the end of Hebrews 4, we get in the priesthood, but the, the talk about the priesthood goes on for the next couple of chapters. And so for the people that are the teachers that are coming after me, I, I, I struggled on how much to talk about the priesthood. I could have done a whole thing about just nothing but the priesthood. And I thought, boy, you know, I'm really going to, uh, take away some of the thunder from the, the other teachers. And so I'm going to kind of focus what this uh, little bit about the priesthood um, talks about in, in Hebrews chapter four and let the other teachers talk in depth about the priesthood. Uh, so they'll have something to talk about. And then uh, also I'm going to kind of set this up uh, by just doing here a little um, historical reference to um, the shadow, which was the ironic priesthood. So just a little background on, on the Aaronic priesthood. So, um, and this is really, this is the, the high priest we're talking about here. Um, so the, the high priest uh, was the chief religious, religious functionary at the temple. Um, uh, once a year on the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, um, the, the high priest would go into the most holy place or the Holy of Holies, and burn incense and, and um, uh, sprinkle animal blood. This is remember uh, the the holy the most holy place was where the Ark of the Covenant sat, um, and uh, they would he would uh, they, we would offer a sacrifice um, in blood for um, his own sins, the high priest's sins, and for the the people of Israel. Uh, then he also had uh, overall charge of of God's house, which was the temple. And you can start to see some of the echoes to um, the Melchizedekian priesthood of Jesus, which we're going to get into in the next couple of chapters. Um, one of the interesting things, you know, there's, these little tidbits are just thrown in Scripture, and, and they're really interesting, and we're not going to spend a lot of time about them, but on them today. But, you know, the high priest, uh, the ironic high priest, could not mourn the dead. Um, if they lost a wife or a son or a daughter, they were not allowed to mourn, um, which is very interesting. They couldn't come into contact with a dead body, um, and uh, they could only marry a virgin, um, which is which is an interesting thing because um, uh, the only way that a you know a woman could be legitimately uh, uh, a virgin in Israel. Um, is to be uh, a widow. So um, it's interesting. Again, talking about you know, death there, a tie-in to death. Uh, and then uh, 
it's called the Aaronic priesthood because, of course, uh, um, Moses' brother Aaron was the first high priest. And here's a, a, an example of their uh, the everyday wear. Um, and then when they were wearing the breastplate, uh, that was the uh, another type dress they had. So, all right. We're going to talk a little bit now about the book of Malachi, because Malachi, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, is mostly about the priesthood and the um, the state uh, that it was in uh, prior to um, you know the coming of Jesus. So uh, Malachi one verse six says, "A son honors his father, and a slave his master." If I am a father, where is the honor due me? This, of course, is God speaking. If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. It is you, priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, remember the animals uh, had to be without spot and without blemish in order to be offered. And so they're bringing these blind animals. Um, when you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? So the priest, you know, at this time of the time of Malachi, um, they're supposed to examine the animals, and, and when they're uh, brought with uh, a spot or a blemish on them, are uh, supposed to be rejected. But the priests then uh, were just accepting the, the lame animals as they came in. So that's one condemnation in Malachi. He goes on in chapter 2. For the lips of the priest ought to preserve knowledge, because he is a messenger of the Lord. Almighty, and people seek instruction from his mouth, but you have turned from his, the way, and your teaching has caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty, so I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people, because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. So the lips of the priests, they were supposed to bring knowledge, um, and supposed to teach the people, but they were not doing it, and they were showing partiality in the law. And Malachi 3.18 says, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into my storehouse, that they may be forced into my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And you will see why I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store. I will prevent the pests from devouring your crops, and vines in your fields and not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all your nations will call you blessed, for yours will be delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. So uh, the, the, they, were, they were cutting short the people, uh, the, the people and the priests were complicit in this of, of uh, keeping the tithes from coming to God. So prior to Jesus's coming, the, this, the priesthood, was roundly condemned by the prophet Malachi for their uh, malfeasance, uh, for their contempt for the things of God. And so this, this priesthood was a failing priesthood. And of course, when you see, or you read the story in the gospel of Jesus, you know, the priests were aligned very much against uh, the Messiah. Uh, Malachi 2, 13 to 15, you have spoken ar arrogantly me, arrogantly against me, says the Lord, yet you ask, what have I said against you? You have said, it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed, and certainly evil evildoers prosper, and even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. Um, this one really spoke to me, because you just see that so much today, that the um, um, people that are doing awful, horrible things, they're just liars and, 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 and boasters and everything, get, get the praise of, 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 of the religious. And um, it's, uh, it's kind of shocking, actually, just how much the um, re you know, supposedly religious people of the world have um, fallen in this of uh, calling the arrogant blessed. So as we get to... Uh, 
Hebrews uh, uh, chapter four, the verses in question, I wanted to look at, you know, kind of tie some of these things up that we've been talking about. Uh, the verses that we're reading here, 14 uh, through 16, they say, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess, pr profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So one of the themes we've been looking at in, in Hebrews 4, just as a reminder, is you know, the idea of drawing near to God, that this was a new thing for the children of Israel. You know, they've been kind of told to keep their distance, and now they're being told to draw near. And one of the key features of this is this idea that they have a better high, uh, high priest, a better priesthood, which will allow them to draw near. And, and, and one of the key features of this is we're going to find out as we go through this is um, we are now in this priesthood when we come into Christ. That, that one of the things, one of the, the people that could come into the, uh, uh, the tabernacle, the temple on a daily basis were the priests. And of course, they couldn't just wander in and out as they please. They had to have a legitimate reason to be there. And um, one, of the, one of the things they were ministering to there. But they could still go, go in. And now since that, that veil had been rent, um, and was was no longer um, uh, a barrier between the the holy place and the most holy place. Um, you know that they could go into the presence of God, and I think that's the idea here: is that we are part of a priesthood, and that uh, as part of our ministrations of uh, the gospel, uh, we're in God's presence, and so we we should draw near to God. So. Keep that kind of in the back of your mind. I'm sure that the, the teachers that are coming behind me will develop that more fully as we as we go through um, the next couple chapters in Hebrews. So um, Jesus was uh, the the real high priest, right? And again, we're talking about real in the sense of we were talking about last week, real versus shadow. You know, Jesus was the tree, not the shadow on the ground of the tree. The law. The Aaronic priesthood, those were the shadows on the ground. Jesus was the reality of that priesthood. Um, and, and we are the reality of that priesthood um, when we come into Christ. So um, one of the things I think that comes out of these verses is that, that um, you know, Jesus, it says in verse 50, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. And, and, and it's been suggested by some um, over the years that the reason God made Jesus that way um, was because so that because uh, God couldn't really relate to us, um, that God didn't really fully understand us because, you know, he's in heaven, we're on earth. God can't be tempted, but we're tempted all the time, um, you know, that, that God, you know, cannot die, but we have this fear of death in us. And I, I would suggest to you that that's not the right way to look at it. Um, the, the, the real reason that Jesus was made like us was not because God can't relate to us. It's because we can't relate to God. Um, we look at God as, as he is, uh, hopefully, um, as uh, so far above us and, and, and um, just vastly different than we are, um, that we... Um, that, that we have a problem with that. And so God sent Jesus to, so that we could come to him in a more relatable way, I think, is a, is a way to think about it. Um, you know, Jesus was tempted like we are, like we are, even though he never sinned. He had to make, and I mean the word tempted there, not tried. Jesus had to make moral choices. Um, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus suffered for his faith. And, uh, you know, if ours is hopefully shining brightly enough, we're going to suffer for our faith as well. Um, and and he, Jesus even died for his faith. You know, that I think is, is a key thing for, you know, if you're ever faced with a, a firing squad or something like that because of uh, your faith, 
you have a, a savior you can look forward to that had the same choice before him, the same ordeal. And, and, and he's in heaven with all, you know, dominion, power, and authority. And, and we can look to him, not that God couldn't have helped us before that. Of course not. Um, he, he certainly helped Daniel in, in his, uh, in the lion's den, but um, that we've had problems relating to God. And so this, this uh, brings us to God. And so, um, we, we don't really have to be afraid anymore. We need to be reverential, um, uh, but we don't need to be terrified to come into God's presence. We, you know, as, as it says in this uh, uh, chapter, we should boldly come in, not because we're so great, uh, but because we have this loving Heavenly Father and because we have this great high priest. Um, so Romans 8.31 sort of talks about this um, mindset that that the the believer in christ uh should have uh romans 8 31 to 34 what what then shall we say in response to these things if god is for us who can be against us who who he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things who will bring any charge against those whom god has chosen it is god who justifies who then is the one who condemns? No one. So uh, these, you know, these very powerful words in Romans 8 are trying to get us in this mindset of having an understanding that we can, we can draw an eye to God um, through Jesus and we can relate to Jesus and certainly some of the things that he went through. So let's talk for a second about the temptations of Jesus since he's talking so much about um, Jesus was tempted just like us. Um, let's read, uh, uh, this is from, I didn't write it down. I think this is Matthew 4. Um, it says, uh, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil or the diabolos. Um, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the diabolos took him into the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift, up, they will lift you up against their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the, the Diabolos took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this will I give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil or Diabolos left him and the angels came and attended him. So let's try to understand a little bit about Jesus and the wilderness, the temptation, because this is kind of what he's the writer of the Hebrews is talking about in chapter four. And what do we learn from all this? Um, first of all, it's important to note that Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness. Um, this was, this was a God given um, thing that, you know, that, that, that Jesus was put in this situation. And I don't think it was, you know, coincidental that he was led to the wilderness. If you ask me and I'll, I'll use my own uh, analogy as poor as it may be, but, I think, you know, if you remember, Jesus had just been given the, the Holy Spirit power in an unlimited un, un measure. He basically, he could, you know, do anything at this point in time. And so um, he is um, led by that spirit into the wilderness. And this is to me, like, again, my analogy is to, you know, with, to be tested with training wheels on, if you will. He's not in the middle of a crowd. He's not in Jerusalem. He's not, you know... Um, pressure being put on him by a bunch of people. This is just him out in the wilderness. And I, and I think one of the keys of this thing is to understanding this is to understand that I think all of these temptations took place out in the wilderness. He wasn't going around at, um, to high mountains in Jerusalem. I think all this is happening in Jesus's mind. This is that temptation we were talking about. I think this was had to be taking, had to be taking place between his ears. And I'll give you some evidence of that in a second. Another thing I would note is, you know, 
I've never been tempted to turn um, stones into bread. I've never been tempted to take over the world. Those not temptations. And it's not because I have a superior moral uh, fortitude or lust fingerprint to Jesus. The, the, the simple fact is I've never been given, you know, immeasurable power. So um, these temptations, I think, are unique to Jesus um, because of the position he was going to be in. So not only was he, in, and here's kind of the point, not only was he tempted in all points like as we yet without sin, he was also tempted in a lot of other places and other things that we're never going to be tempted with. You know, he, he, he had temptations you and I are not going to have to deal with. So um, I think, again, that gives us comfort that, you know, Jesus has been truly tried and tested um, and came through without sin. So um, these had to be in his mind. Like, first of all, you know, um, he was taken, you know, if, if we look at one, um, the, the last one, he was taken up to a very, my, uh, very high mountain and showed all the kingdoms of the world. Where's that mountain? Well, you know, of course, everybody knows the highest mountain in the world is Mount Everest. It's 29,000 feet. Now, I haven't been on Mount Everest, but I have been at 29,000 feet in an airplane. I've been higher than that, actually. I've been up, you know, 35, 36,000 feet in the air. I can tell you this. You can't see all the kingdoms of the world from that plane, and neither can you from Mount Everest. So this had to take place in Jesus's head. There's no mountain in the world where you could see all the kingdoms. Uh, it just doesn't exist. But you can certainly go there in your mind, aren't you? You can certainly go there in, 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 in your head and think, you know, I've been given this power. Who, who's going to stop me? You know, is, is, is Caesar going to stop me? No. You know, Herod? No. Pontius Pilate? No. They can't stop me. Um, but uh, uh, so he had, to, he had to deal with this. And another thing to think about in this is that, again, this is important. These were genuine temptations. They had to be in the mind of Christ. And it doesn't, it doesn't give me, doesn't cause me to want to draw near to God if my Savior is just having um, tests thrown at him that don't actually resonate in his mind. Because I can't relate to that. I have things that resonate in my mind all the time um, that, that, that ping off my desires. And, and Jesus did too. It, 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 it really defeats the point if he wasn't really genuinely tempted by these things. Um, because it, it, the, one of the main points is trying to bring us, um, you know, comfort to come near. And all of these things, we're not going to have time to go through this m morning in detail, but all these things, we're going to come back to Jesus later on in, in real time around people, with all sorts of things going on. So this is kind of a test run where, where God's helping Jesus prepare for his ministry. So we have the, the, the three temptations. One is the turning the stones to bread. That's to use God's power for personal comfort. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the pinnacle of the temple to throw himself down. There's a verse which um, Jesus would have been saying, okay, God, you know, here's a verse that talks about me. I'm not allowing my foot to be dashed against the stone. I'll throw myself off the temple. Everybody will see the angels catch me. Um, and that's just not the proper use of the scripture. Um, it's, it's kind of showing off. And it's also, you know, kind of personal proof, you know, that, yeah, I really am who God says I am and all these things. And, and, and that was uh, putting God to the test, which we're not supposed to do. And then, the, of course, the high mountain was, was um, uh, you know, perhaps Jesus thinking, you know, I could just, if, if, if this is all about the earth being full of the, uh, um, knowledge of God and, and as the waters cover the sea, then let's just do it. Let's just get this thing over with. And that's sort of uh, Jesus usurping God's authority and time frame and not doing according to God's will, you know, that um, kind of overthinking. We all do that, right? We all have those thoughts of, you know, we think we know better than God. Boy, you know, um, if I was in charge, this is the way I get rid of all, you know, um, disease and hunger and all this stuff and we or I get rid of this pandemic you know I just click my fingers and the my the pandemic would be gone the classic uh, genie with three wishes kind of thing what would you do if the genie gave you three wishes oh I get rid of this pandemic just like that well that's not God's will because the pandemic's here because God can snap his fingers and this pandemic disappear but it's obviously God's will that it be here for the time being so uh, we are out of time but I'm just going to say uh, one last thing um, here. 
that these these all these things were to prepare Jesus for what was to come. Um, and and by them he learned obedience. These are all scriptural things. And then he also um, was tempted so they can help us again by drawing near. So that is the um, kind of the takeaway from these things. And uh, that is it. I will, um, uh, again, you need to, uh, for anybody that perhaps is new, you need to log off um, and log back on in the memorial service portion at the chapel um, website. Um, or if you're dialing in, dial that the, there's a new number. Um, it's also on the chapel website to dial in. Uh, to the memorial service. Uh, thank you all for your uh, attention for the last four weeks. God bless you, and uh, we'll uh, see you again soon, Lord willing.